or religious, but it's a pragmatic or active doing things and seeing what things has to change. Your card identifies postmodern as incredibility to meta narratives, to paganism, where we pass judgment on truth, beauty, and justice with all criteria for the judgment. Another aspect of postmodern thought is going beyond the modern dichotomy of the universal and the individual. Modern thought was caught up in either large universal systems or universal laws or the romantic cult of the individual, isolated from the society. Postmodern thought focuses on the local community, the local context, and we can talk of more contextual relativism, where legitimation and action takes place through communicative action, through conversation, through linguistic practice. And human language is contextual. There is no universal uh, language. The language are culturally rooted with the local meaning universes and the problems of translation uh, from one culture to another, not being just a technical problem, but the issue of meaning. There is further a re what's called, there are many new words in this. A, a re-narrativation of culture. There's a focus on narratives, on folk stories, originally by Vladimir Kopp in Russia. His accounts of folk stories has been taken over to Renoir, I think, structuralist philosophy, and it's general folk stories. Further, there is an expansion of rationality. It's not only cognition and science, which is stationary, but also the ethical dimension and the artistic dimension has uh, its own truth. And it's being recognized uh, on the same, same level as science. Art is not merely an aesthetic experience, but a form of knowing the world. Rationalist thought has the core the non-linear, the imprecise, the unpredictable. It has separated art from science. Mathematicians have been more open to an affinity of science and art, emphasize the elegance and beauty of mathematic models as I'll just mention one further thing before going on to psychology. That is the interconnectedness of knowledge and knowledge, especially discussed by your talk. That's the issue. Who has the power to determine where and what is true knowledge? Modern thinkers are fond of quoting Bacon, knowledge is power. Today, there's the reverse relationship, power is knowledge. So Plato's question to the relation of power and knowledge is again uh, actualized. Do the philosophers present a given conception of knowledge because it is true, or is it true because it is presented by philosophers? Can I go over to both area and that exhibit is the psychological knowledge, is it true? Do the professors represent the knowledge because it's true? Or is it true because the professors of psychology represent the knowledge? <coughs> and uh, of course, postmodern knowledge, as indicated, is part of a more general culture. And not just the artistic culture or architecture, uh, but also part of the economic uh, structure of current society. There's one American literary critic, Jameson, who has placed uh, the culture of modernism to the logic of culture in late capitalism. To him, postmodern thought 
is nothing else than the ideological manifestation of the uh, global American economical hegemony. It is the logic of consumerism and capitalism. Okay, so much as a very general presentation of postmodern God. We are not going into the constructionism and not the philosophy of language. Then, psychology in a postmodern age. Here, I will mainly talk about, I will only talk about Western psychology. I believe some of the works of Rubinka Rubinstein and Mengotsky may be related to postmodern ideas, but I am not Psychology was, as I mentioned, a child of modernity. It was the term psychology first arose in the 15th century. At the same time, no, 16th. At the same time as the Reformation, and it was became an Enlightenment project in the 17th and 18th century. Man could live for many thousand years without having a science or psychology. <laughs> and one reason for the development of psychology, I believe, was the focus on the individual in the land sense. In previous ages, where there was more focus on the community, the unity, then the single individual did not have that uh, focus. <coughs> and if we take the descriptions of postmodernity serious, then the whole concept of psychology becomes problematic. If man is decentered, the individual subject is dissolved into ensembles of relations and linguistic structures. Where is the subject matter of psychology? If man disappears and consciousness disappears in the texts and in relationships. <coughs> and as I mentioned, there are very few little writing on psychology and postmodernity. And I don't think that's accidental, or that the psychologists are just late and see what's going on around that. But they're taking the postmodern ideas seriously, may undermine much of the conceptual structures of psychological theory. Not necessarily of practice, but of the psychology. I will list, uh, I will mention four structures which of the, okay, uh, four structures of psychology which are entrenched in modern thought. And here I will posit, though some here may not agree, that behaviorism and humanism are two sides of the same modern concept. They both remain within the modernist uh, paradigm, but are two sides of it. First theme is legitimation. Both in natural science, behaviorist psychology, and humanistic psychology, legitimation was a very uh, serious matter, and I think still is. In some areas, psychologists can't say anything without quoting some physicists who has said something related. Everything has to be proved There's that it's the same way of thinking as physicists or natural scientists. It's not enough to say that this makes sense psychologically, but it has to be externally justified by uh, referring to natural science physics. So much for the behaviorists. The humanists have also from their external legitimation sources, that is existential philosophy, where um, they often draw in very, what do you say, briefly and often superficial references to, uh, to the existential universe. This, uh, I'm saying, it pertains to the psychology of Maslow and Rogers which I believe are very superficial in their external views of existentialism. Or May is another issue. He is, he is uh, seriously into the existential thinkers. So he does not fall into this. Nor does Medar Boss and uh, that kind of thing. 
extension of the world. The other modernist structure, as in psychology, is the um, um, dichotomy of the universal and the individual. Behaviors taking the uh, universal side, making universal laws of behavior for all of them based on some very special experience. And the humanist that uh, often <coughs> went into the single individual human being, his self-actualization, self-realization, and so on, cultivating the inner selves with the dichotomy between the universal or the social and the individual. The alternative would be to regard man in this context, in his relations with other men. And what has characterized behaviorism indefinitely and much of human psychology, not all, is an ahistorical and asocial attitude. The idea of self has been freed from tradition and authority and dissociated itself from the society. There's a modern quest for the self pitted against society with an ideology of self which is historically rather peculiar. Sir Kittner, the first day of the year, the second, mentioned how different notions of personality, one personality, multiple personalities, so existing in other cultures. But some of psychology takes a specific Western notion of isolated individuals and makes that into a universal. Well, the psychology characters with this abstraction of content from process. Behavior as well as consciousness and feeling are dissociated from the content from intention objects of human activity. There was a double abstraction of modern psychology decontextualizing in person from a social and historical situation and also separating the processes of behavior from their content. The content was of the culture, the knowledge was taken as accidental and local, the processes were essential and universal. And further, there was a theme on co of commensurability and mathematization. In one part of psychology, everything was to be mathematized, to be formulated in numbers, and nothing was scientific if it was not statistical. In another, there was a cult of the uh, unique, the relation, the relation, going against any forms, uh, form uh, systematization. I believe that's uh, uh, there's, yeah. uh, if what I've been saying is valid, then the basic concepts of psychology, the psychological science, are out of touch with the social reality of a postmodern age. It is questionable whether psychology can survive as a science by merely clinging to the latest developments in the neighboring fields. What, what I see in psychology, general psychology is an emptiness, a boredom board with a very little new insights coming. The only discipline of psychology which has had anything to tell mankind as a whole and also philosophers is psychoanalysis, which is not regarded as a science within the scientific psychology. But for general psychology, there's what we call an imbalance of exports and imports. There's very little export of psychological knowledge to the culture at large. But there's a very large import of knowledge on neighboring disciplines. Today, everything is psycholinguistic, psychoneurology, psychosubernetics, and so on. 
So it's kind of psychologist with an inner central emptiness is clinging to the core of the yes. as kind of like so. And of course, when we say this may be only some temporary weakness of things to be corrected, but if the basic tenets of psychology are the dissolving, then where there is the science itself. If psychology is the science of individual selves, and in a postmodern society, the individual self is dissolving or being conceived more as a relationship, not as a network of relations, uh, then it may be difficult to understand the, these relations on the basis of an individual self. So, and further, with the fo focus on an inner psychic apparatus of cognitive models, uh, if these are intellectual dead ends, leading to in in infinite regresses, <coughs> then psychology, uh, the science of psychology, as the science of human activity, may be or be beyond repair. This, by the way, holds for large domains of theoretical psychology, yeah. at least in the West. Other sciences are more taking the place with, uh, of understanding human activity uh, as anthropology, which is more and more being used also in psychology and in education. Anthropologists, they study the culture of the human beings that was the age. They focus on the local context and on the material ways of produ producing and I will be able to develop it here but I see anthropological and ethnomethodological form as being much closer to the postmodern image of man. Now, before I conclude, I would like to just sketch two, de uh, two developments which I believe in the area of psychology, which I believe are more adequate to, to a postmodern reality. And that is professional practice and qualitative research. In, in modernist area, professional practice has been looked at some uh, lower kind of knowledge, <coughs> just as application of some basic university. Was discovered by the theoretical psychologists. And qualitative methods have been used as maybe some help for formulating a more tough designs of experience and questions. But what I'm saying is that black is turned into white, that the bad or secular things, professional practice and qualitative research, are in, in, a, post, in a modern area are within a postmodern approach become central areas of thought of the And this may not is not so strange. I mean, if we look at postmodern knowledge as described by Leotard, he says postmodern science by concerning itself with such things as undecidedness, the limits of precise control conflicts characterized by incomplete information, factor, catastrophes, and pragmatic paradoxes, is theorizing its own evolution as this continuous, catastrophic, non-rectifiable, and paradoxical, or paradoxical. So this kind of, for some call it fussy logic, is, according to your talk, part of the postmodern science in general. And the, the, the psychotherapy practice, psychoanalytic writings, quantitative research, have been dismissed by a modern scientific psychology as being too fussy and unscientific. But with the change in the concept of knowledge, accepting fussy, unclear, catastrophic uh, knowledge as genuine knowledge, then these uh, secondary areas of psychology become important. This 
is especially uh, that uh, just magic. There's one author called Donald Schuren who has written on the reflective traction, studying how therapists, <coughs> managers, therapists, architects think in action, and he describes there what they learn at the university is mismatched to the situations of practice with the complexity, uncertainty, instability, uniqueness, and value conflicts which are part of their control. Uh, so, what I'm trying to say is that these descriptions of practice are in harmony with uh, what's more general than being described as postmodern words. And this is not, I mean, it's a return to practice, but it's not a return to a, to a mechanical practice. Some of these uh, thinkers in this area, they are using their uh, philosophy or phenomenologies and existential thinkers as high people to understand the very structure of what it is where in the fact is this one. So one uh, what I see as possible movement is the um, uh, a, a new reflection and taking serious of the professional practice and uh, and the very last point I mentioned is for taking research. I will get more into that in the workshop I believe on Saturday. There, the, the quantitative research in Peru uh, has been not been accepted as a scientific method in psychology until this is. And the quantitative interview are defined as an interview with the purpose of obtaining descriptions of phenomena in the light world of the person interviewed with respect to interpreting their need. And this, I believe, is rather close to postmodern concepts or knowledge, which I will take very quickly. One, the interview is a conversation, a dialogue between two partners, partners about the topic of conversation. In philosophy today, there is what's been called the conversational terms, where philosophy is understood as discourse, dialogue, conversation. Second, knowledge as narrative. In an interview, people tell you stories which can be uh, uh, revealing uh, of that life situation. And also, the narrative structure of knowledge is being uh, uh, developed in Further, knowledge as linguistic. The textual linguistic structure of knowledge being a central theme of postmodern thought. And the interview, of course, goes on in the linguistic medium. But yet, I don't know of any psychological institute in the world which has courses in linguistics or in text interpretation. I know of many institutes in psychology who have courses in statistics and mathematics. But the language which every psychologist uses in his practice or in interview research is kind of there we are like uh, uneducated natives with no professional knowledge or of central media or knowledge. Further, the, the contextual character of knowledge, which I which I emphasize for postmodern knowledge, is also appeared in the uh, interview. The interview is developing within a specific context created by two persons. Uh, contextual based knowledge. And lastly, knowledge as interrelation. <coughs> I mentioned that several times in the the embeddedness, the interrelatedness of knowledge. And the interview is literally an interview. You can split the word into the, the, the view between. So, Thank <laughs> you.
Yeah, well, we should take the last quote from the, the main thing about the ethos. The main thing is that we both can talk about the ethos and the ethos of person. What can block the ethos is us, your thinking about what you have to get done here, and my thinking about my own thoughts and feelings by myself. The you and the me can defend this thing. It's not all views that matter, it's the inter, the inter, the And I'll stop there. What I tried to interpret was two developments in, or two aspects of psychology, uh, therapeutic practice and qualitative interviews, which I believe are in love with the post Whereas the general structures, concepts of psychology are seen as uh, and too entrenched in modern support to be able to account for the post war. Yeah. And I'll stop with that and be happy to ask questions. First, I'll see if uh, our discussants have a, a comment, and then I'll go to the floor. So, Donald, first. Uh, Thank you. So, I would like to thank uh, Steiner Paulin for very uh, provocative talk and for a very good overview of much of postmodern approach. And I would like uh, more to raise some questions uh, to him and to the audience. And I don't know how much these questions are one that he, that Steiner himself might have raised had he had more time. I don't know. So I want to really make uh, four short points. The first, more general. The second, about the status of modernity. The third, about the kind of life that postmodernists promise us. And lastly, about uh, other resources that might be mentioned for our situation. Um, first, it seems that uh, the situation presented uh, is true in many quarters, that uh, certainly on the level of ideas, uh, modernity is, at least in many places, in retreat, and that many of the ideas presented seem uh, to have considerable intellectual, cultural energy. Uh, it seems, however, important to remember that uh, modernity is still uh, itself not very actualized through much of the world. If you take the core of modernity to have to do with particularly science, uh, democracy, human rights, and so on. Uh, it's very much like the uh, answer that Mahatma Gandhi gave to a question he was asked once. He, he was asked, what do you think of civil, civilization? And his answer was, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> and maybe we can say that also about much of what is valuable about modernity. And that leads me to the second point that I think the question would be, given that some of the main ideas of modernity are challenged, what, does, what do postmodernists uh, take to be of value for modernity? Is it simply to be rejected? I, I'm sure that Steiner probably doesn't think so, that, that there's actually much of value that gets uh, transformed, perhaps understood in a different way. And again, particularly, we might look to questions of the uh, centrality of democracy, of human rights, 
perhaps they get interpreted differently, but certainly what we see in the world now, if this is, uh, these are postmodern trends, uh, I don't know if they are. I think there may be quite modern trends in other parts of the world. So I think there is need for some clarification there. Uh, and maybe to set up the, uh, to set up our approach, perhaps more as a dialogue between modernity, what is the value of modernity, and these postmodern critiques. And also to stress perhaps the way that uh, postmodern thought itself is very much uh, a product of modernity. It's a kind of radicalization of a kind of search for truth. So that's my uh, second point, that there's a uh, need for clarification of the dialogue uh, between uh, modernists and postmodernists. And third point is that uh, I personally don't know if I want, would want to live in a world uh, governed by postmodernists. I am, uh, I do, it, to be honest, most of it seems uh, at this point uh, more negative and critical. Helpful, but more negative and critical. And I don't know whether there are very, very many resources to actually uh, live well. In particular, I think it would be important to talk about the nature of ethics and the nature of political uh, structure. And again, how much uh, of modern concepts would be uh, important to identify as central. And that leads me to the last point. <laughs> which has to do with the question of, uh, it seems to me that a, an understanding of uh, what we might call post-modernity is incomplete. Uh, this is very much in line with my talk yesterday. It's incomplete without bringing in the increased opening to what we might call pre-modern traditions and what is of value there. And again, I think this all has to be done, as I said yesterday, dialectically with a consideration of the uh, advantages, disadvantages, problems, values. But uh, to, to me, the access to uh, pre-modern traditions, and that, by that I mean uh, whether it be Greek philosophy, the traditional religions around, from around the world, or shamanism as Stanley we'll talk about in a while, I think there are valuable resources there, and I actually don't think uh, postmodernists can survive very long without making use of them or be very friendly. So, uh, and then as well, I think, uh, because I think there are actually many ways in which uh, postmodernist approaches actually point back towards uh, more ancient resources. Uh, I think much of the, for instance, uh, criticism, I'll be, I'll be brief now. Uh, time to finish for, for soon. Okay, just to point to the, uh, the way that criticism of the Roots of uh, or roots of some of the roots of ecological crisis in modern views of nature, for example, I think points for many people back to pre-modern traditions, and one could say the same about uh, feminist critiques of uh, rationality and modernity. So I'll stop there. And there were many important points to raise. I will go in rather brief in reply. Okay. Uh, third, uh, I mean, mo modernity and postmodernity are, of course, historical terms. They are not absolute categories. They attempts to describe what's going on in the society today. And uh, uh, there is also much debate whether there is anything about uh, which there is anything, whether there is anything, especially postmodern. Others say it's just a continuation of modernity. I mean, I have a uh, because it's, uh, it's near modernity. And these trends I've been describing are more or less further than the trends of modernity. And that may be a question of terms. Uh, whether one should put an absolute characterization more on a postmodern or see less complications. And historically, of course, the modernists, the postmodernists, have grown out of the world for and would not be thinking of it. And again, it's called post-modern, it's not called anti-modern. 
but it's very easy to get them to do this kind of drug to back off in this price bond. Because it's, uh, I think you used the term, radicalization of the drug. And I think that's a very accurate term. And uh, especially Habermas has been in the dialogue with the modernists, and with, with the postmodernists, and both the, the term, with the uh, postmodernists and politics. And it's easy to be too negative, focus on the critique of the size of or modernity. I was trying here to at least show some aspects in psychology which could be developed and taken more seriously within a postmodern approach than they have been in modern psychology. That is the practice of therapy and qualitative research. Uh, there's also I just read an article of Michael's on this by an English social psychologist on the postmodern self, where he was uh, uh, trying to say detronize the psychological product of the self and uh, uh, go to an ecological perspective where self was more part of nature. He was even seeing the psychological product of the self as part of all the manipulation and destruction of nature. What was needed was the conception of the self of man as being part of nature. So I mean, there are, and I believe that we can some more constructive uses of these elements in psychology. And one good source for that is to go to the three models, as you mentioned. And actually, there are some things of that. that within postmodern architecture, there are, besides the Las Vegas, Style, there are trends of all that to the evil images which are more built to foster a sense of community. Uh, it's uh, getting away from the tyranny of the straight line of these uh, human containers as we see all around us and to get into the more circular and unpredictable uh, village style within architecture. And, within, and I think in literature there's a whole fact of going back to the human pages. And uh, yeah, I think I can call Umberto Eco a postmodern writer. His uh, bestsellers, essentially, uh, they are from the medieval pages. But very much in his life, he reflected postmodern So I think that there are definitely better call to other uh, efforts of understanding or
needs mobility. The act of creation. Millions is a mobile act. It becomes sterile when either part of it is rigid. Although it may produce a child. Can you share the fears of the old school? Which don't seem to want to hear the new school the inter new intercourse. Because for me that's where the spiritual dimension comes in. Thank you, Paul. You said about the language, language, and it's a tie to use language, although I'm not an uh, English native speaker. Uh, and it's, it's very difficult to get away from the old concept since the language is so embedded, is so figured by dichotomized concepts. It's difficult to talk in the direction or to, to have an adequate language to express the more personal the relation. Uh, there is, by the way, one other likely source when it comes to some of the cosmic uh, ideas, and that is in folk music. If you listen to the text there, there are many uh, themes there, especially in the war, I believe, and also in many of the uh, songs by Talking Heads. Do you know that thing? Talking Heads. And they have one album called, called Stop Making Sense. And that's the third curtain critique of the question. Charles? Thank you for your excellent presentation and clear overview of some of the themes of postmodernist thought. I'd like to go back to where you started in the talk and discuss the viability of the very premise of postmodernism. And I'd like to do this briefly by returning, if I might, to Aristotelian logic. And away for a moment from the fuzzy logic characteristic of postmodernism. Let's look at the three principal claims of postmodernism. <coughs> the first one can be said to be there is no universal knowledge. So to clean the tabula rasa of this blackboard. I put down the first premise of postmodernism that knowledge is not unitary. The second premise or theme would be that reality is not universal or the same for all humans. And the third would be that there is no unitary self. Now, 
if what I'm describing is right, if these are really claims made implicitly or explicitly, <coughs> by postmodernism, then postmodernism is itself self-refuting. Which brings me back to the title of your talk. Because postmodernism is a contradiction in terms. If it really claims that these three propositions are true. The first reason would be that if there is no unitary universal knowledge, then there is no postmodern knowledge. There are only local traditions to cite postmodernist themes themselves. So the claim that there is a postmodernist knowledge is by the very assumption of postmodernism self-refuting. So if postmodernism is true, then it's untrue because it's not true for all. All right, so knowledge is therefore plural in postmodernism. Briefly, the same thing holds. I'm coming to the conclusion. Right. Briefly, the same thing therefore also holds logically for the second and third claims. This may be a silly formal exercise in logic, but I don't think so. Because the implication of your talk at the end is really to take for granted these three premises and then proceed to draw conclusions for psychological knowledge, therapeutic practice, and social scientific research. And if these premises of postmodernism are at best questionable and at worst false, then your conclusions are also questionable. What I would like to draw from my argument is the following suggestion, which you yourself made when referring to a book by Frederick Jameson about postmodernism, namely that postmodernism is a conversation among a number of writers, most of them French and American, with very little reference to the kinds of knowledge, tradition, and selves that stand outside that conversation. And therefore, the postmodernist themes and claims or an ideological discourse, a local narrative, and a conversation among a few intellectuals with little direct applicability to social science or politics or ethics. 
I was talking as a psychologist, not as a philosopher. I'm not uh, so well into philosophy that I was trying to make a philosophical argument for postmodern thought, but I was taking it, maybe I forgot to mention it, but was taking the postmodern philosophy as given and seeing what consequences that would have for psychology. And we could discuss the thesis you are putting up and whether they are adequate presentations for postmodern thought or not. And also, you also mentioned your plans in the start that uh, they were based on Aristotelian logic. Uh, what I see fruitful of both these ideas is taking them as starting points for understanding further reality. And to my viewpoint, they are the best, this, the postmodern descriptions are the best descriptions of the postmodern culture that I've seen and are those most relevant to psychology. And I would disagree, I mean, it's an intellectual discipline, no doubt about that. But it's not just a North American, Western, French uh, debate. What struck me in postmodern uh, writings is one, that there are many feminist writings. It's not the traditional masculine uh, modern thought. And strangely enough, there are many Arabic thinkers coming up in the postmodern texts uh, uh, of Palestine writers from other cultures. And this is just a postulate from my side, but I believe postmodern thought is relevant and being picked up by the third world cultures, especially the